Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I was struck by something I read just before I left the States in the New York Times, an, an essay on the opinion page that was titled, How the Internet Tried to Kill Me. And it was written by a man named Zick Rubin, who told, uh, uh, who told the fo a story that began when he Googled himself. He found a wikia.com entry that, dis that said, Zick Rubin was an American social psychologist 1944 to 1997. He found that disconcerting because he's, as far as he knows, alive. And so he g went online and edited his own entry. And then the next day he went online again and someone had edited it back <laughs> so that he was dead again. And he got in touch with the founder of wikia.com and it turned out that th this was an, e this is what is called in Wikipedia circles an edit war. There are a lot of edit wars on, wi on Wikipedia just because everybody is free to edit and occasionally they get into a little loop where everybody thinks they're right. And Zick Rubin discovered that the problem was someone had a printed source, the Penguin Dictionary of Psychology, third edition, published in 2001, which also said that Zick Rubin Zick Rubin's years were 1944 to 1997. And so the, the Wikia people felt, on the one hand, they had a printed source, and on the other hand, they just had a guy. Zick Rubin is not only a social psychologist, he's also a lawyer. So he thought about suing them for defamation and, and discovered that it, it, in legal terms, it's not, strictly speaking, defamatory to say that a person is dead. <laughs> well, the end of the story is they corrected it. It's now correct, but uh, in my view, either he or the New York Times headline writer has it exactly backwards. It wasn't the internet that tried to kill him, it was a book that tried to kill him, and it was the internet that brought him back to life. The book existed for 10 years without his noticing or anyone that he knows noticing that it reported him dead and, and uh, calling it to his attention. And there is a fourth edition of the Penguin Dictionary of Psychology that's only a year old and repeats the error. The point being that the forms of knowledge that we feel we're so com comfortable with are changing very rapidly. We had the illusion that knowledge was fixed in permanent form in books and encyclopedias where we could rely on it. And now that illusion is drifting away from us because we know that knowledge is in the cloud and it's in these notoriously imperfect sources like Wikipedia. My book begins at a certain point. It begins in, in a specific year in 1948. With the, and my premise is that the information theory that was created in that world in that year at Bell Labs by a mathematician and engineer named Claude Shannon serves as the beginning of the time when it became clear to us that all of our history has been an information era. So I tell the story of Claude Shannon who, who was faced with a problem. All the engineers, the communications engineers, were faced with a problem of definition. What is the stuff with which they deal? The purpose of the laboratory was to solve problems of communications engineering and they were squeezing stuff into telephone lines and they had to worry about the efficiency of that process and things to do with noise and things to do with error correction and things to do with bandwidth, a term that the engineers had invented not long before. And Claude Shannon solved in one fell swoop a lot of these technical problems by creating what he described as a mathematical theory of communication. And we refer to it now as information theory. And the premise of my book is that this mathematical thing, the defining of information, the, the, the declaration that this is a thing that we can measure in bits, it's, that's the fundamental particle of information, that this realization underpins our world and leads to our 
to this modern predicament that we find ourselves in. The idea of information uh, is one term that we use to describe uh, we are ambiguous a bit about what information is in a way. And in a kind of classical hierarchy of knowledge or, or a classical hierarchy in this area, you talk about data being more of the information that Shannon was describing and information being something which has been given meaning by a human and knowledge as being something which has been given significance uh, to help one understand something and then wisdom being something a little bit harder to define which is um, a kind of more philosophical thing. Now, do you see, uh, when you're talking about information, are you, and was Shannon really talking about data? Well, this, this turns out to be the paradox that I ended up having to wrestle with because we begin with Shannon defining information as a scientist would define it. The way, the way Isaac Newton defined motion, before Isaac Newton, motion was just a vague thing. Mass was a vague thing. Gravity had not, these were not scientific mm. terms. He had to make them, he had to mathematicize them. Mm. And Shannon mathematicized information, measuring it in terms of bits. Mm. This paper of his was also the first time anybody used that word. Immediately, he found himself forced to emphasize that this thing he was talking about had nothing to do with meaning. It didn't matter whether the message was true or false, mm. or even if the message was a bunch of nonsense. It was the same number of bits, and so, um, so yes, you could say data, mm -hmm. eh, but you're left with the same problem. And this is our problem too, because we have all of these bits either stored in our devices mm -hmm. or in the cloud and confronting us every day. And so we have to remind ourselves that what we want is not the information, it's the meaning. Do you talk about the early, I think it was the Chaldean, uh, I think Mesopotamian cultures that the Greeks referred to as being one of the first to develop any form of uh, representations of data and mathematics and kind of operating on data. There was a particular need for the Mesopotamians to be able to make calculations, partly because they were a society which produced a surplus and they then exchanged that surplus and they needed to work out how to do that and to interact with each other around exchange, if you like. How would you situate the kind of developments you describe in your book? The kind of would you say there are social needs that lead to information? I would say there's a, a chicken and egg problem there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can say that the Chaldeans needed to use the forms of writing that they invented because their economic um, empire was expanding or mm -hmm. for whatever social purposes mm -hmm. had emerged. Or you can say that writing w developed and the existence of writing enabled new forms of mm -hmm. social organization. Mm -hmm. Now. I did say that, uh, that Shannon's work was in a way purpose-driven. He was working for the, the AT&T uh, research laboratory mm. and trying to solve particular problems of transmission, of, mm. of communication. But it's also true that his work became possible because of an accumulation of bits of intellectual treasure. Mm -hmm. His work was possible because of the work in the 19th century of George Boole, developing symbol symbolic logic, mm. and of his contemporary Alan Turing. In a way, I'm more interested in how the time becomes right for intellectual mm. inventions to occur, mm. and less, I, I tend not to believe that society reaches a certain point or has certain problems and so the technology has to appear mm -hmm. to, to solve those problems. The printing press was not invented so as to make possible the scientific revolution mm. and the reformation. Mm. The printing press was invented and then things that people could not have imagined mm -hmm. emerged from it. There's a observation that was made by Norman Soloff who is an economist and Nobel Prize winner, etc., who observed 20 or more years ago that in the age of computing, you could see the impact of computing everywhere, but in the statistics, which by which he was referring to efficiency and economic productivity and so on. And one may well revisit that, although in the age of Twitter and email and so on, as, as you observe, you know, there's a lot of inefficiency in communication productivity as well. You know, we are in a flood of information, as your, the subtitle of your book indicates. You know, is that flood actually generating something productive. I, I think that in a way that that question is synonymous with 
should we be better people? Mm -hmm. You know, the tools are what they are. And, mm -hmm. and yes, they're, they're very much in our faces because they're so new and they're changing so fast. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say we need to be more efficient users of Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say that we either should or shouldn't use those things. I s mm. sort of, I, f I feel that we are all aware of these challenges, mm. but I'm not sure that people haven't always been aware. Didn't people confront challenges of how to uh, make more efficient use of the telephone when suddenly you had this mm -hmm. box in your house and in your office? And did they agonize as we do today over whether they were forward-looking enough in their use of the devices, I'm not even sure. Are there areas which you feel are, are untapped, which we should be paying more attention right. to? Right. I do think um, th our self-consciousness about all of this stuff is built into the fact that these technologies are about information. <laughs> and so we use the technologies to talk about themselves. Mm. I mean, there's a, there's a recursive loop there. I don't think people need to worry too self-consciously mm. about whether they're doing it right, mm. which is not the same as saying that we collectively as a society don't have problems to solve. Mm. Um, I think even Twitter, and I'm pretty new to Twitter, is going to be a solution to some of these problems in ways that we can't necessarily mm -hmm. anticipate yet. I think Twitter is a sort of solution to a search engine problem. The most obvious problem for Google, which may or may not change even now in real time as Google moves toward the future, is that it's not personalized. Twitter, on the other hand, is all about our making individual choices about whom to follow. Mm. And so in a way, we are choosing the information stream that flows past us on our little screens. We're choosing it by virtue of following 10 or 50 or 1,000 people. Mm. And having made those choices, we are undoubtedly bombarded with a lot of junk. At least I am. Mm. And then you unfollow people. Or then you just accept the fact that we are producing a lot of junk too. And, and in choosing who to follow, we're just bending the arc a little bit more in the direction of wh what information we need.